Living in the rural southeast, I can tell you that things can get pretty sketchy out here. Sometimes Bigfoot's running out with a Glock 19, other times Goatman's doing backflips with a freaking crossbow. You never know what you're going to see out here, truly. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true stories sent in by viewers just like you from rural areas. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Today's episode is sponsored by our longtime friends at HelloFresh. HelloFresh takes the hassle out of mealtime this spring by delivering pre-portioned ingredients and easy to prepare recipes right to your door. Skip the checkout lines and get outside in the warmer weather because HelloFresh has dinner covered. April is Earth Month and HelloFresh is always committed to a cleaner planet, which we love here in the swamp since we cover so many horror stories based in the great outdoors. On average, HelloFresh meals have 31% lower carbon footprints than the same meals made from supermarket ingredients. Plus, nearly all HelloFresh packaged ingredients are curbside, recyclable, and almost every area of the United States. My grandma always said good food is too precious to waste. HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients cut down on your food waste by at least 23% compared to grocery shopping, which is good for your wallet and the planet. So, what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com slash Swamped50 and use code Swamped50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Swamped50 and use code Swamped50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. Late 90s Tennessee Creepy Story by Toadstool Dickens When I was just a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both my parents worked full time, so I was often sent to stay with my grandparents, who had a plot of land near, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. They had been in East Tennessee in that area for many years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story and remained there a reasonable time after. Recently, I had a reason to return to the area in Tennessee after spending most of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the site driving the same roads made me reminisce about my lazy summer days at my grandparents, learning to shoot on the same 22 my grandpa had taught my mom, feeding fish at her neighbor's stocked pond or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this info that I'd be visiting the area to my mother, she told me about a time I scared my grandpa half to death. Allegedly, I had told everybody I was hanging out with Bigfoot, and at first I had no idea what she was on about. Then, for some reason it hit me like a bag of bricks, I remembered precisely what happened with startling clarity. The experience of adulthood gives a new kind of context. And unfortunately, I don't think Bigfoot actually makes an appearance in this story. Before we start, here's some information about my grandparents' land. The house was on a small hill, surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hay field and then to a wood line. Those woods at least were a half mile thick on either side of the home, and probably went several miles behind it. I hated the hay field because it was pokey to play in, but I liked hanging out in a spasm behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property, just in the wood line to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stay where I could see the house so that the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere I went as well. I didn't take the whistle this time, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age. And the best part of the camp was that it was out of sight of my house. I really liked going there because I felt like I was all alone and had some sort of peace. That was the only stretch where it got more profound and deeper than my knees and thus the only part where I would actually have to swim inside of this creek that would go across. So naturally, I spent much of my time in the water, splashing around, skipping stones, and just being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone that shouldn't be there. It was a man, a stranger if you will, at the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, pale skin so dirty it was stained. I could tell his age and thought that he was probably 50 or 60 at least. I have no better guess now, as he endured long years of hard living, I'm sure. He wore no shorts, no pants, 
only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist. I thought of it as, like, how Moses would dress in the Bible or something, thanks to some of those illustrated Bible stories I grew up seeing. Around his neck, there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tathers of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of detritus, primarily bones, but some, some flowers and bits of dark glass, I think. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was kind of terrified. No one had ever stumbled into the secret camp that I had. He was frozen. The man, however, was smiling this weird, this weird smirk. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down in a don't stop for me type of wave, telling me to go back to what I was doing. I didn't react at first, being startled and reeling from this whole thing. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again and I eventually splashed back and soon it was like we were playing. We both threw water at each other for just a few minutes. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water and so did I. I pushed him and he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed back towards the house. Then as my grandma kept hollering, he looked at me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the bush, completely silent the whole time. He was holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone. I said no, and she became agitated, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer, I really didn't know how to. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, gripped like iron the whole time. At home, the real inquisition began. I, I, didn't, I didn't really have new words. The, the event and this reaction overwhelmed my ability to really explain. Such silence further irked my grandma, and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again when I started talking. I told him about the man hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and then he disappeared when Grandma started hollering. I remember they digested this briefly before sending me to my room. I was happy to go and be in a more comfortable area, but Grandpa did not, he didn't yell like he normally did when I was misbehaving. I knew something had to be off. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench looking over the hay field turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and then put them next to his shotgun. I knew it was odd for him to have the gun out of the closet. Previously, we had only used it to shoot bottles, and some I would throw into the air like clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied by speeches about how guns were dangerous and only for adults. He went through that whole story again, telling me about guns. Then he went through my story. His tone was deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how hairy this man was. I told him absolutely everything, thinking this was the correct answer. He asked where, and I told him where. He mediated on this, and I grew even more nervous, worried I was in some sort of trouble or causing problems. I just wanted the situation, wherever it lay, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear in the name of Christ and on my mother that I was telling the truth about everything, I, I did. After some time, though, the family memory became that I hid in the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everyone was distraught with me, and I was forbidden from returning to the stream or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, could have been better. Even so, I didn't go into the spasm for a while. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure, in hindsight, it was probably only like a week. The hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary age self. When I started going back to that little camp and a little creek area, I took a bucket of toys, mostly my Godzilla collection, and a thick stick plucked from the woodline. I was rather conflicted on what to do if the man returned, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or maybe both in turn. Eventually, he did show back up, though. He appeared next to me as I was dozing off under a tree on my side of the creek. I was once again gripped with terror and horror. He was not smiling, his face was expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long, before I finally smelled him. 
I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started looking through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys individually, only to toss them into the dirt. Finally, it came too much and I started to lecture the man. I was telling him how he got me in trouble, how he was a weirdo, how he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through the things and calmly watched my tirade, face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout, having become hot in the sun. I remember the man made a noise, kind of like a, a grunting snort, and when I looked at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my toy. I wanted to laugh too, but was more determined by my, you know, will to stay sullen. Once again, everything was out of the bucket. He put one figure, which was Guido Hara, back into it. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the pail by its handle, and began his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not even a human word that I could figure out, and gestured forward. At first, I didn't comply, despite knowing he wanted me to follow him. After just a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more empathetically. With this further prompt, I did get up and eventually come along, the man making approving noises and putting out his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard to keep up. Eventually, he would stop when he lost me, knocking on trees and sticks and whistling arithmetically so I could find him in the vegetation. He never returned for me, often to guide me forward with noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald area. It was like, almost kind of like a field, but not quite. It looked like the grass had been scorched. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground. Before going to the tree line alone, he returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from a self-discarded plastic drum line with a small pelt and smooth bark. On the back half, there rested a fly-covered carcass of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place by the same electric corded that the man had used to make his necklaces. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Giodora in a bag. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and beckoning wave. I saw the sledge pouches held many odds and ends dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, and glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed me with an air of business and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit down again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at recess. I did not miss Giodora much anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss, in retrospect. Giodora was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its apparent ability to hold things. The man returned and gestured me to follow by slapping his thigh. I did this readily during the hike before I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path needed to be straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up the hill, but from out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but I did not go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back up to the house around the opposite side. There I laid in the shrubs by our front door pretending to be asleep. I swore I had been there the entire time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm on my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day I returned to the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there, however that summer he revisited me to sit under the tree, throw rocks at the water, and yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought to have yet, which I have not yet to eat, which I have yet to actually eat, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I still eat sometimes, and he would also take my old bucket and use it all the time, I noticed. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped as he did with the first meeting. 
You may wonder why I set this. You may wonder why I sent the story into Swamp Dweller Show rather than some wholesome blog. Well, there are two more occasions I wanted to account for. One gruesome and one awful. The event that occurred near the 4th of July, I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially very wary of little fireworks, but quickly appreciated their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box, I gave him gratefully, and even taking the empty container is likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent fuel. Using the bang snaps, I scared a turtle into the water on the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from afar on the shore. After stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, the man noticed the turtle. He scooped up a smooth stone with a little thought and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waited off to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp. One leg knocked clean off. On my side of the river, he took a new piece of the stone from the bucket on the side rounded. He, he fit it to his hand perfectly, and then he, he, he hit it, cutting this thing open working with deft experience. The man began chomping the live turtle above its neck, and pulling the shell from the top, the thing struggled and bled as it was bisected. The dome eventually came free, and the turtle dropped to mingle its viscera with dirt and sand. The man rinsed the shell from the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to put the turtle into the flowing waters of the creek so it would leave. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek or the man from visiting me again, however sometimes he would try to call me away from the stream with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions he would join me, on others he would leave. The last time we met we sat under the tree sharing cocktails. From the woods came a whistling and a woodpecker's staccato knocking. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood collected his bucket and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and felt comfortable with the man as a guy, so I did as I was asked. He took me back to the area that I told you about, that bald area. A direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to whoever or whatever was talking to him. Waiting for us there was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless, wrapped at the waist. She was dirty with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground, and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed on me. The other child would not look up for whatever reason. I didn't know what to do and didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose, and I learned under all that dirt, they were indeed human. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's bare back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at the girl lazily. The man echoed her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled toward me, stopping close enough I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin, but not emaciated and slightly taller than me, should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more. And the girl leaned close, pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all. Instead, they only pressed limply against me and breathed so loud, and that's all I could hear. During this time, the woman approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand, delivered a flurry of slaps at the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair in one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me and face the bear. One side of her jaw was bulged out, skin smoothed over a lemon-shaped bump. The deformity twisted her mouth. Her nose faced to one side as if it was affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye bulged and roomy, and the other startlingly regular. It looked at me blankly and was dark brown. Finally, the woman shook the girl's head, spat off to the side, then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. At this point I fled. There was a commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house and my absence went unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what happened. Wanting to forget and avoid getting in trouble and not knowing what to think about the girl, 
the couple, or what was intended for me. Instead, I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I honestly begged not to be taken there, claiming it was boring and lonely. Sometimes, when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of birds calling on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and tried to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he had never before, but eventually school started, classes and friends eased me from the thoughts of the dirty man or the people in the clearing. Time did the rest, of course. Now that all of the people in the clearing were of a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, and brown hair, are standard enough that they all could have been unrelated. But I'm pretty sure they lived together. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words and language. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways and in unlikely places. And those real people call others kin. And that through the chain of human connection, even a hermit living in a rundown shack is somebody somebody. So I am asking if anybody that ever hear this story have any idea what I could have encountered, who I encountered, or why, please let me know in the comments. Something ran in front of my car by Anonymous. It was a warm summer night, and I was driving home from a late night dinner party with some friends of mine. I had taken a shortcut through a rural area to avoid traffic on the main highway. As I drove down this empty road surrounded by nothing but darkness and trees, I felt a sense of unease creeping up on me. I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I just felt like something bad was going to happen. And suddenly, as quickly as that thought came, something darted across the road in front of my car. It was so quick that I barely had time to react. I slammed on the brakes and swerved to avoid hitting it, but I didn't get a good look at whatever it was. My heart was absolutely racing. I got out of the car to see if there was any damage, and as I looked around, I honestly couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. It was just a quiet, deserted road in the middle of nowhere. I really did try to shake it off thinking it was probably just a deer or some other various animal out in the sticks that ran out in front of me. I got back in my car and continued my way for some time, but the feeling of unease continued to linger. It never really went away. It was as if something was watching me from the shadows, waiting for me just to let my guard down so it could take me out. I drove further down the road. I, I began noticing that the trees on either side were getting denser and darker. It honestly felt as if the forest was like closing in on me, like walls slowly moving toward me. I began to feel as if I was trapped, with no way out, a caged animal. Suddenly, something jumped out on the hood of my car. It was a figure, dark and twisted, with eyes that glowed in the darkness. It let out a blood-curdling scream that echoed through the forest. I was absolutely paralyzed with fear, unable to move or even take a breath. The creature continued to scream and pound on the hood of my car, as if trying to break through the windshield and get to me. But then, as suddenly as it appeared, the creature vanished. It ran off into the woods as if something had startled it. I was left alone in the dark, deserted road, heart pounding in my chest. After just a few seconds, I took this opportunity to floor it and fly out of there like a bat out of hell. I eventually and finally made it home, still shaken from the encounter. I didn't want to tell anyone what had happened, thinking they would just dismiss it as a hallucination or a trick of the mind. But the next day, as I was reading the local newspaper, I saw something that made my blood run cold. The front page article was about a string of disappearances in the area, with witnesses claiming to have seen a dark figure lurking in the shadows before the victims vanished without a trace. It was then that I realized that I had encountered something incredibly different on that lonely road. It was no ordinary creature. It was something more sinister, something that preyed on unsuspecting travelers like me, and I knew I was lucky to be alive, and to this day I am very grateful. Rural Hit and Run by Joshua T. Tree I woke up early this morning and decided to go for a jog in the countryside. 
The sun had not yet risen, but I felt energized and ready for a good workout. I put on my running shoes, grabbed my water bottle, got my music, and headed out the door. As I made my way down the empty road, the crisp morning air filled my lungs. The only sounds were the rustling leaves and chirping of birds. It was a peaceful and serene environment, perfect for a morning jog. But out of nowhere, I heard the sound of a car approaching from behind me. I thought this was weird, but I didn't try to think too much of it. I tried to get out of the way. I turned to see a black sedan speeding towards me, though. I quickly moved to the side of the road, barely avoiding being hit. The car swerved and continued down the road erratically. I was shaken but continued my jog, hoping it was just some sort of stupid reckless driver. But then, to my absolute horror, the same car came speeding back towards me. This time, I had to drive into a nearby ditch to avoid being hit. I couldn't believe what the heck was happening. Why was this car trying to hit me? And what did I do to become a target? I decided to sprint back towards my house, hoping to outrun the car, but it kept coming back, each time getting closer and closer to actually hitting me, becoming more brazen every time. I was terrified and out of breath, but I refused to give up. Finally, I managed to make it to my house, locked the door behind me, and I finally felt safe. But the fear and the adrenaline were still coursing through my entire body. I honestly couldn't believe what I had just experienced. Was this some sort of sick game? I decided to call the police, but when they arrived, the car was nowhere to be found. The officers assured me they would patrol the area and try to find the car, but I knew deep down that it probably wouldn't be found, but it would come back. They took pictures of the tire impressions and the marks that it left, and for weeks, I was far too scared to even leave my house alone. Every time I heard a car approaching, my heart would race, and I would break out in a cold sweat. The car never did come back, and eventually the fear faded. But every time I go for a jog in the countryside now, I can't help but remember that terrifying experience. I always keep an eye out for any black sedans ready to dive in a ditch if necessary. The memory of that morning still haunts me, and I know I'll never forget it. This might be, you know, less scary and supernatural than a lot of the stuff you get sent, Swamp Dweller, but I appreciate you so much if you decide to share this story. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true rural horror stories that were sent in by viewers just like you. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button a few times as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it in its algorithm, and that's incredibly helpful for the swamp to expand its ever-growing waters. If you're new, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe to our channel, be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss a new episode, and definitely be sure to check us out on other platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. You can download all your favorite Swamp Dweller Scary Stories absolutely free over there, and it will always be free. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, it's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis, you can submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. We also have a subreddit at r slash the dark swamp. I would love to share your story with everyone here. If you've made it all the way to the end and are still listening, I really appreciate you. The code word for today is Flaming Hot Flamingo. It's always fun to confuse people in the comments and I love seeing how many of you actually make it to the very end. Also, for a very limited time, I am selling handmade hot sauce once again. I try to do this once a year, but since I grow everything myself, including the peppers and the other ingredients included, it does take a while to make everything happen. I only have a few bottles left, so if you would like to pre-order one and get one shipped to you in May, be sure to use the link in the pinned comment to purchase a bottle before they are all gone.